Legal Forum of Wisconsin and the Family Research Institute of Wisconsin are very proud to present to you Mrs. Phyllis Schlafly. Please join me in welcoming this stalwart, gracious lady. To the Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jolene, and thank you, friends. Uh, that was really overwhelming. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can live up to that type of an introduction. Uh, but I am very happy to be here under the sponsorship of Eagle Forum of Wisconsin and Family Research Institute of Wisconsin. Uh, you have some great leaders in both organizations, and I'm just so happy to see this large group uh, that has come out today. Now, the topic that's been assigned to me today is our activist judges. And I guess I'm coming from the point of view that most of the problems, if not all of the problems we face today, are due to the judges. Uh, one good line that George W. Bush used in his campaign for re-election in, uh, in 2004 uh, was this one. We are not going to stand for activist judges who are legislating from the bench and remaking our culture through court order. And that's right. We are not going to stand for it. Uh, we've had uh, a whole bad doctrine that's grown up in this country that whatever some judge says is the law of the land. Uh, but uh, the judges have been doing something uh, that is not the law of the land. They've been trying to make new law. Now, we do need judges for the same reason that baseball needs umpires. Uh, you have to have somebody to call the balls and strikes. But if an umpire ever called a batter out after two strikes, you know good and well that the fans would not put up with it. Uh, the umpire is there to call the close ones, but cannot change the rules of the game. And what the judges have been doing in this country is to change the rules of the game. They are taking away our right of self-government. We believe we should live in a country where we're governed by our elected representatives, whom we elect and whom we defeat when we don't like what they're doing. Uh, but these judges have set themselves up as uh, people who think they know better, they're smarter and wiser, they believe they can override the other branches of government and the will of the American people. And that's why I call them supremacists. I think activist is too nice a term. A supremacist is somebody who thinks he's supreme over everybody else. And that's exactly what the judges do. Now, the value of my book, and there are a couple of copies for sale, they are collector's items. They may be the last two copies in print because I'm coming out with a revision within the next month. Uh, but I talk about these issues and common sense issues, uh, common sense language that everybody can understand. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand what the judges are doing to us. Take the matter of the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, Congress passed the text of the Pledge of Allegiance a half century ago. We like it the way it is. Millions of kids have said the Pledge of Allegiance every day in school. And up pop a couple of judges out there on the left coast who suddenly discovered that the Pledge of Allegiance is unconstitutional because it contains the words under God. Now, that case went up to the Supreme Court in the summer of 04. And my own belief is they wanted to throw out the pledge, but they thought if they did, it might help to elect George Bush. So um, they punted, they bunted, they, they put it aside. They got out of it on a technicality. But it's coming back. Uh, Mr. Newdow has already filed his case again, and we will face that issue again. And we are not going to stand for judges who tell us we cannot say the Pledge of Allegiance in any public place. <laughs> Then they went after the Ten Commandments. Now, this country has hundreds of depictions of the Ten Commandments in courthouses, in public places, in parks, all over the country. And the ACLU discovered there was a pot of gold under every one of these Ten Commandments. Because if they could sue and get some activist judge to throw it out, uh, they could collect attorney's fees for filing the same brief they were filing in all these other places around the country. And that's what they've been doing. 
When they got the Ten Commandments monument thrown out of the courthouse in Montgomery, Alabama, they and their friends collected nearly a half a million dollars from the taxpayers of, in, of uh, Alabama uh, in attorney's fees. And uh, they were doing this around the country, having a lot of fun with it. And the Ten Commandments cases went up to the Supreme Court. Well, the Supreme Court sliced it in half. They had two cases. And they handed down decisions that are irreconcilable and don't make any sense. Uh, one came out of the state of Texas. And the court held that uh, that monument, we're going to let that stand because it's outside. And because it was put up with a secular motive, it was put up to promote Cecil B. DeMille's great uh, movie, The Ten Commandments. <laughs> so we're going to leave that Ten Commandments monument. But in the other case, uh, the Ten Commandments monument that was in the courthouse in Kentucky, that's inside, and that's bad. And we suspect that it was put up with a religious motive. Therefore, they have to take it down. Those were the two five to four decisions. And then the court dealt with the problem of what are we going to do about the Ten Commandments on the walls of the Supreme Court? Are they going to call in the blasters and blast it off? Well, they said, we've thought about that. But we have decided that since you really can't read what's on the tablets that <laughs> Moses is bringing down from the mountain, therefore we won't have to get rid of the Ten Commandments on the walls of the Supreme Court. This is what's going on in our courts. Uh, take the matter of the Boy Scouts. Now, we all like the Boy Scouts, but the ACLU doesn't like them. They have lots of cases. You see, the Boy Scouts pledge to do their duty to God and country. And the ACLU tries to tell us that is a violation of the First Amendment. Now, you know good and well the First Amendment doesn't say anything to prohibit the Pledge of Allegiance or the Ten Commandments or the Boy Scouts, but that's their case. And they are right now trying to get the Boy Scouts out of all the public schools in our country. The Boy Scouts have had a jamboree every four years on some military property in Virginia. They had one last summer. This is a big deal. It attracts about 40,000 Scouts and about 300,000 parents and scout leaders and spectators, the president usually goes. So the ACLU went to some Clinton-appointed judge in Chicago, and she ruled that they can't have it anymore because this is an offense against the Establishment Clause of the uh, First Amendment. Now, we shouldn't put up with that, and I'm sorry to say our wimpy senators uh, decided that uh, they loved the Boy Scouts. So they put a resolution on the floor that basically says we love the Boy Scouts. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> you think this Clinton appointing judge is going to care that the U.S. Senate passed a resolution saying we love the Boy Scouts? <laughs> Congress has the duty to take away from the courts the ability to deprive us of the Pledge of Allegiance, the Ten Commandments, and the Boy Scouts, uh, which uh, amount to an acknowledgment of God on public property, and there's no reason why we can't do that. And it is up to Congress to remedy this mistake, this arrogance of the supremacist judges. Now look at what they've done on the issue of marriage. The laws of every one of the 50 states and the federal law all said that marriage is the union of a man and a woman as husband and wife. We like it that way. The Defense of Marriage Act was passed by Congress in 1996, which says exactly that, and furthermore says that if one state goes off the deep end on this subject, the other 49 states don't have to pay any attention to it, which is a proper use of congressional power to interpret the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution. Uh, this uh, law was uh, overwhelmingly passed. It was signed by President Bill Clinton. One of the few who voted against it was John Kerry. Uh, well, at any rate, you'll find if you talk to lawyers, you don't spend too much time talking to lawyers, but if you do, uh, they'll tell you it's just, just a matter of time till judges declare this law unconstitutional. Now, it's a perfectly fine law. It's elegantly written, and it's not unconstitutional. And it has survived a couple of tests. Uh, but you still have these people out there who say it's only a matter of time till they throw that out. 
So this instigated some state uh, DOMA laws, defense of marriage laws, and these marriage amendments. And we now have them passed in 19 states. And uh, they're very similar. They vary a little bit in text, uh, but they're very similar to put into the state constitution that marriage is a man and a woman as husband and wife. And uh, they have passed with uh, at least a 70 per, an average of a 70% majority. This is, uh, people like this. But the problem is created by what happened in the state of Massachusetts. Now, the Massachusetts State Supreme Court, by a four to three majority, where the Chief Justice uh, was a South African, and we are now told she was really uh, copying South African law, uh, decided they would reinterpret the Massachusetts State Constitution and authorize same-sex marriage licenses. And um, the Massachusetts State Constitution was written by John Adams and adopted in 1780. And any notion that John Adams wrote anything that could mean same-sex marriage is just patently absurd. <laughs> but anyway, they did it. So this is what's caused these problems. Now, uh, we have 19 states that have passed the uh, marriage amendment and put it into their co state constitution. And you will have this on your ballot this year. And I certainly hope Wisconsin is not going to let us down. We haven't had one defeat yet. And you are going to make sure that we uh, get a good passage of the marriage amendment in Wisconsin. That is extremely important, not only to your state, but it's important to the whole country. Uh, we have been able to defeat the uh, gay movement everywhere, including the state of Oregon, which is the one, the state where they put most of their money to defeat one of these amendments, and they failed there. So it's a very popular thing to work on, and it is important that you do it and do it now. And uh, we're counting on you to make, make sure, sure that uh, that gets that's through. through. Uh, but this is only the beginning of the mischief of the judges. Uh, the, the godmother of these bad activist decisions is really Roe v. Wade, where the Supreme Court invented this right of abortion that nobody else had seen in the 14th Amendment for 100 years. And uh, we, uh, we are hoping and looking forward to the day when Roe v. Wade is overturned. Uh, <laughs> But it is, it is a tremendous example of what we call activist or supremacist judges, because it was a clear invention of something that wasn't in there. The judges are doing similar things in all other issues. I was very happy to see the uh, big reaction that happened to the Kelo decision, the property rights decision, last summer. Now, uh, the... Um, Constitution says that private property can be taken for public use. And what the Supreme Court has done is to change the word of the Constitution. They didn't like that word, public use, so they've changed it to public purpose and then gave a very broad definition to public purpose. Uh, and and uh, in the liberal mentality, a, a good public purpose is giving the government more tax revenue. So if they can take the property away from somebody who pays less taxes and gives it to somebody who pays more taxes, uh, that is a good public purpose. That's what, that's what the Supreme Court has done. And I'm happy to see when they handed down this uh, Kelo decision, which was coming out of Connecticut, uh, it has instigated a great public reaction across the country. Uh, at least half of the states have proposed constitutional amendments or legislation to deal with this power of eminent domain. In other words, the power of the government to take private property. They're only supposed to take it for public use, which is like uh, building a city hall or a, a public transit or something like that. But what they want to do is take it and give it to private developers uh, who will pay more taxes. Or as somebody said, you can take the Motel 6 and give it to the Ritz-Carlton because they'll pay more taxes. And we shouldn't allow that. And bringing up the matter of taxes is another area where the courts have, have shown their uh, activist supremacist bent. If there is any issue that ought to be completely a legislative function, it is the matter of raising taxes and how to spend the taxpayers' money. 
And yet we have state court judges all over the country who've gotten the idea that they can be activist judges just like the federal judges and that they can order the legislature to raise taxes in order to put more money into the public schools. And there are lawsuits in about 24 states today where this is going on where you have a combination of groups who come together who want more money put into the public schools and they want an activist judge to order that. Uh, one of the uh, bitterest fights was in the state of Kansas. Uh, Kansas has been a traditionally Republican state, but the rhino Republicans cooperated with the Democrats and the Democratic governor to uh, say yes, yes sir to the state Supreme Court when they ordered them to put enormous hundreds of, uh, of uh, thousands of dollars more into the public schools. Enormous sums of money have been ordered in, uh, in New York. Uh, in in uh, Arizona, uh, the court got so carried away with its own supremacist power that imposed fines on the legislature of a million dollars a day until you do what the court said in putting more money into the public schools. So again, this is the matter of judges who are out of control and who must be stopped by the other branches of government. The idea of having the separation of powers is you have three branches of government, the one gets out of line, the others are supposed to do their duty to put them back in line. And almost any topic that, that you uh, name, the, the issue of immigration, again, it was the Supreme Court that started this flood of illegal aliens coming into this country with a decision that threw out the Texas law that said that, uh, that uh, the public schools were for citizens. Now, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that gives aliens uh, the right to go to our public schools, but the Supreme Court invented that right, and that became a magnet for illegal aliens to come into this country, put their children in our schools, and uh, cash in on all the other benefits. Uh, one of the late developments among these activist judges is their citing of foreign law. Now, they all took an oath to uphold and defend the United States Constitution. They have no business citing foreign law, foreign decisions, foreign courts for their decisions. But there are six Supreme Court judges, justices, who have now bragged about using foreign law in uh, rendering their decisions. And um, uh, two of the most active in that are uh, Justice O'Connor and, uh, and Justice Ginsburg, the two women. And we are glad uh, Justice O'Connor isn't on the court anymore. She voted twice for abortion, twice for gay rights, and twice against the Ten Commandments. How bad can you be? But anyway, she's now running around uh, uh, criticizing people who criticize the courts and saying we should, you know, she said we're, we're moving, she thinks you're moving into a dictatorship because some of us dare to criticize the courts. But anyway, we still do have free speech, and we're doing that. But to show you how the court is using foreign law, the first big case that did that uh, was the Lawrence v. Texas case, which was the case uh, where the Supreme Court threw out the Texas anti-sodomy law. Now, you can think whatever you want to do about sodomy, and there weren't many states that had anti-sodomy laws, but Texas did, and there's nothing in the Constitution to prohibit that. And so Justice Kennedy uh, looked to Europe, and he cited uh, the European Court of Human Rights, the British Parliament, and some brief filed by some UN High Commissioner. And based on that, he threw out the Texas anti-sodomy law. And incidentally, that, that decision has now become uh, the mainstay of those who want to terminate all morals legislation, whether it's marriage or pornography or anything else. Uh, uh, they're using that decision as their source. Then they, they got further carried away on the matter of the juvenile capital punishment. And we know about this case in Missouri because it came right out of St. Louis. And you had this 17-year-old who wanted to commit a thrill murder. So he broke into a woman's apartment at 2 a.m. and he duct taped her head and he hog tied her hands and feet and then he put her in her car and drove her to, uh, to a bridge over the Merrimack River and threw her in the river to drown. And he had all his due process. This went on for years. 
and the jury and the judge sentenced him to capital punishment. So this made its way on up to the Supreme Court. Now, there is nothing in the Constitution to prohibit capital punishment, and there's certainly nothing about the age of people who uh, are uh, sentenced to capital punishment. But Justice Kennedy looked to foreign countries in order to uh, get uh, this creep Simmons off the hook. And he said he saw a trend against executing 70-year-olds in Iran and Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. <laughs> and he named seven countries, none of which have any jury trials, so they'd probably just take him out and behead him in the first place. <laughs> but at any rate, that was the decision. And, and this is judges inventing new law. Now, one of, the, one of the main areas where they have invented this law is the whole area of pornography. Uh, Judge Bork once said that the suffocating vulgarity, what did I lose? The suffocating vulgarity of our current culture is in large measure due to the courts. They didn't write the pornography, but what they did was to knock down all of our attempts to maintain a decent society. And this all happened in a few years in 1960, where in a space of three or four years, the Supreme Court handed down 34 decisions, uh, which no judge signed, but which were valid Supreme Court decisions, that completely overturned the law of obscenity. And this is what gave the green light to Hollywood, to the pornographers, uh, and to make them realize they could do anything they wanted. And it's gone from bad to worse in the succeeding years until one of the most recent decisions uh, was one in the state of Washington, where the legislature passed a law putting a low fine on retailers who sell videos to teens to show them how to kill policemen. And the uh, court uh, federal judge, Clinton appointed judge, threw this out. Uh, he said this video game is just as much entitled to First Amendment protection as the best of literature. And there are now about um, six uh, cases where the courts have upheld these violent video games uh, sold to minors. And uh, in fact, they're in the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth circuits. We've got similar bad decisions on these video games. And again, it, it all comes from the, uh, the bad decisions of the US Supreme Court. Now, uh, we're all very happy that President Bush has been able to uh, name two new people to the Supreme Court. And um, Justice Roberts will probably be like Rehnquist. Uh, we're pretty sure Justice Alito will be vastly better than O'Connor. And I will point out to the pro-lifers in this room that he was so skillful in his confirmation hearing, they never made him say that Roe v. Wade is settled law. He was better than Roberts on that because they did make Roberts say that, but he didn't. However, for those of you who are interested in the subject of parents' rights, I will point out to you that uh, the Supreme Court has been okay on the matter of parents' rights, but the lower federal courts are almost uniformly a disaster. And that is, uh, they're paying no attention to the Supreme Court decisions, which uphold the inalienable right of parents to guide the upbringing of their own children. And the lower courts are always holding in favor of the schools, the public schools, and against the parents. And the most outrageous was the one last November, coming out of the Ninth Circuit on the left coast out there, uh, in the case called Fields versus Palmdale School District, where the court held that the right of parents does not extend beyond the threshold of the school door and that a public school has the right to provide its students with whatever information it wishes to provide, sexual or otherwise. The court said that parents' right to direct the upbringing of their children does not encompass the right to control the upbringing of their children by introducing them to matters of and relating to sex in accordance with their personal and religious values and beliefs. 
This was a three-judge panel. One was appointed by Bill Clinton, one by Jimmy Carter, and one by uh, Lyndon Johnson. And uh, this was a case where the school had given the kids one of these nosy questionnaires asking them, are you thinking about sex, and how many times have you thought about wanting to kill yourself, and so forth. And they said parents have no uh, right to stop that. The kid had to take the questionnaire. We had a very similar case coming out of New Jersey in another circuit where the students were given a 156 question questionnaire. These, these nosy questionnaires are very common. Uh, where the kid is asked, uh, how many times have you used illegal drugs? Is it five to 10 times, 10 to 20 times, 30 to 40 times, more than 50 times? Uh, uh, how many times have you engaged in sex? What devices did you use? How many uh, times have you thought about killing yourself? Personal nosy questions about what goes on in your family, et cetera. This case kicked around in the court for several years. It got up to the appellate court. And the court, uh, I filed an amicus brief in this case. The court admitted that the questionnaire was mandatory. It admitted that the questions were suggestive. That is, if you ask a kid a question like this, that one about drugs, the little kid is going to think, well, it must be pretty normal to be using all those drugs. Uh, nevertheless, they held that the school had the right to give it, and the child had to, take, had to answer the questions. I'm sorry to say Alito was on the panel that decided that. And uh, we now have a situation where similar anti-parent decisions have been handed down in five circuits, first, third, sixth, seventh, and ninth. And so uh, it's not enough that uh, uh, President Bush has gotten a couple of appointments on the Supreme Court. Uh, we hope he gets another one. I don't know. Only God knows if somebody we could do without several of the others, but you know, it's <laughs> not my choice. Somebody else is going to be deciding that. It'll, it'll be a knockdown, drag out fight when it happens. But uh, that doesn't solve all our problems. We have hundreds of these judges in, in, in uh, the lower federal courts. And I'm sorry to say, um, they're not all Clinton and Carter and LBA judges. Something happens to these people after they go on the court. They get to thinking they're supremacists. They, they've developed this theory that we have a living and evolving constitution. And they're in charge of uh, bringing it up to date. Now, we have a process of amending the constitution, but the judges are not part of it. And they're simply out of line. When did this all start? It's all happened in my lifetime, not the lifetime of you young people out there, but it's all happened since the regime of Chief Justice Earl Warren. Now, Earl Warren had no judicial mentality. He was a politician. He was the governor of California. And it'll tell you about his ideology when I tell you he was nominated by both the Republican and Democratic parties. And he got his appointment to the Supreme Court as a result of a crooked deal at the 1952 Republican National Convention in Chicago. I was there. And the deal was he would deliver the California delegation on the essential rules vote if he would get the first appointment to the Supreme Court. And he delivered, and he got it. And Eisenhower was later asked if he made any mistakes while he was president, and he said, yes, too, and they're both sitting on the Supreme Court. <laughs> OK, so he set about to make the judicial system the most powerful branch of government. He was the first one to say in a Supreme Court opinion that the Supreme Court decision is the supreme law of the land. Now, you all had phonics. You've read the Constitution. And you know that the supreme law of the land is the Constitution itself. And the laws that are made in pursuance thereof is not the court decision. But they've developed this theory. And they've gotten the law schools and the law professors and, and uh, the legal community to buy it. And uh, that's what they say. And uh, people stand around and say, if some judge said it, that's what they're saying about these same-sex decisions. Some judge says it, we have to accept it. There are all kinds of ways that Massachusetts should have taken care of their own problem. Uh, Hawaii and Alaska had that problem a number of years ago. And they took care of it in their own states by passing a constitutional amendment right away to overturn the Supreme, their state Supreme Court same-sex marriage decision. But uh, 
uh, we, uh, we, we need to deal with it that way. But we also need to deal with the problem of these supremacist judges. And in my book called The Supremacist, uh, it not only lays all, out all these issues in common sense language, but it has remedies. In other words, there are a lot of good books on the court. But the thing that's different about mine is it's an easy read and it has solutions. Most of the others don't have any solutions. And I, I have 10 different solutions. But the main one is for Congress to use its Article III power to limit or redefine the jurisdiction of the federal courts to say they cannot hear any cases that challenge the acknowledgment of God as a violation of the First Amendment that they cannot hear a case to throw out the Pledge of Allegiance or the Ten Commandments, that they cannot hear a case to throw out the definition of marriage. Now, the House did pass the bills I want in the previous Congress, but they met the graveyard in the Senate and never went anywhere, and they have done nothing in the current Congress. They're all standing around with their thumbs in their mouths, because basically because they're not hearing from you. And that's what they tell me. You know, if they were hearing from you, uh, they might do something. But that is, that is the main solution. And uh, Congress needs to redefine the jurisdiction. And don't let anybody tell you Congress can't do it. Because they just did it on two other issues just this past fall. One of them is a matter of the lawsuits against the gun manufacturers. You know the gun control people are looking for the deep pockets. And most people who murder people don't have a lot of money, so they want to go after the gun manufacturers and hold them responsible when a criminal kills somebody. Congress took that away from them. They cannot do that anymore. And that uh, uh, law has already been upheld by the court. Another one they did, 10 years ago, uh, Congress passed a law to build a fence in San Diego to keep the illegal aliens out. The environmentalists have held up this fence for 10 years. I don't know if they're worrying about a snail darter or a spotted owl or something else, but it's been one lawsuit after another. Just this past fall, uh, Congress passed a law <laughs> saying that the fence will go forward. They had some expression like with expeditious speed, and no court can hear a challenge to it. And that has already been upheld by the court. I mean, the courts know that Congress has this power. And they, I, I mean, I just ask you, aren't the issues of the Pledge of Allegiance and the Ten Commandments and the definition of marriage just as important? Yes. But anyway, that's what we need Congress to do. So I think we get back to uh, the matter of self-government. And that is a bottom line issue. Are we going to be able to make our own laws through our elected representatives? Are you, the people of Wisconsin, going to be able to decide what is your definition of marriage? That should not be for some judge who's got exalted ideas of his own wisdom to decide. And that's why it's so, it's so terribly important uh, that you make sure that you pass your constitutional amendment. That's one way to deal with it. Uh, if Congress passes the legislation that I'm uh, urging, uh, that would not, you, you still need your your constitutional amendment, because the law that Congress would pass uh, would only refer to the Defense of Marriage Act passed by Congress. So we need all, we need to protect marriage on every front, uh, every way we can do it. And of course, I, I have to say, um, thank you for all your help in defeating the Equal Rights Amendment. If that had gone through, we would have had same-sex marriage 25 years ago, because we now have two courts that have held for same-sex marriage based on the Equal Rights Amendment. And for those of you who don't remember, the word in the ERA was sex. It wasn't women. So if you uh, deny a, a marriage license because there are two men, you have clearly denied a right on account of sex. And uh, so fortunately, we don't have that, but we have a lot of other uh, problems. Um, but we do, we do have some good news to report. Now, the um, American Bar Association was really very concerned about some of us who are criticizing the court. And they hired, <clears throat> they hired uh, one of these uh, public opinion um, firms to take a poll to see what people think. You know, a lot of people decide things based on what polls say. And they used the most extreme statements they could find made by any legislator and did their poll. 
And uh, they found that the majority of the American people believe, and I quote, that judges are arrogant, out of control, and unaccountable, <laughs> that jud judicial activism has reached a crisis, that judges ignore traditional morality and should be impeached. <laughs> So that's hopeful sign. So the public is out there. But what we need to do is to have people like you able to discuss these common sense issues. Anybody in this room could discuss these issues just as I have presented them to you today. Don't be intimidated by some of these lawyers who hey, you don't know what you're talking about. You can talk about it. And that is what my book is designed to do. And the, the paperback edition will be out in about a month. It's got about 60 additional pages, uh, three new chapters. And uh, what I hope it will be is a handbook for action so that you'll have a study group. You know, that's the way the conservative movement got started in this country, was by study groups. Uh, the, and that was pre-internet, pre-fax machine, and when telephone calls were expensive, and we had all these little groups studying congressional reports on communism. And that's how we had an informed electorate. I hope you will take my new revision, and the order blanks are on your places, and, and have a study group and come together and you can have uh, one session on the, the acknowledgement of God, uh, Pledge of Allegiance and Ten Commandments, and one on marriage, and, and one on pornography, and, and uh, one on the property rights, and all the different ones, so that you're conversant with it. I will tell you, I have done several hundred uh, radio interviews on the subject of that book, and every town in the country has got a Rush Limbaugh wannabe. And, and, and they're 95% they're conservative, but they don't have a clue in how to carry on a conversation on this issue of the judges. They don't know any more than anybody in this room on this subject. <laughs> but you have, to, you have to teach them. You've got to make it part of our daily conversation so, so that people are familiar with these issues and know how to uh, argue them so that we can win these battles. And it's uh, not all a matter of who is the next Supreme Court justice, uh, but it's who's on the federal courts and what they're doing and what Congress is going to do about it. So thank you for being a wonderful audience and listening, and I'll be happy to take questions. I think the purpose of the mic is so it'll go on the tape. Yes, I'm a female from Kenosha. And um, your speech was terrific, of course. But um, how can we assure in times to come that we have elected and appointed policymakers that have actually read and understood U.S. Constitution. Well, we can't uh, we can't be assured of that. But uh, with with uh, many of our representatives, we get another crack at them every two years. Uh, <clears throat> the Senate's kind of out of control. We only get them every six years. But we need to work on that, and we need to have an informed electorate uh, of people who know who they're voting for, and who, uh, and then. Uh, who demand that we get good judges. Now, I, I'll point out another uh, factor to you. When President Bush appointed Harriet Myers uh, to the Supreme Court, uh, many of us, and I will say uh, Eagle Forum was out front on this, uh, that she must be withdrawn. Uh, first place, she was a feminist. And the second place, she was completely unqualified. She was in her 50s, and she had never written anything on the Constitution. And uh, with all the well-qualified people in this country. And uh, this was a real example of the conservative movement asserting itself uh, so that it's not just a Bush party 
I think the conservative movement has principles, and we stand for the principles uh, regardless of who is in office. And it was a, a really great victory for the conservative movement when uh, President Bush uh, saw the error of his ways and withdrew her and, and appointed Alito. And that was, a, that was really great. And it, was, it really was due to grassroots demand. So you're not assured. I mean, there, there are many of these judges who are appointed by Reagan and, and Bush who've gone bad. And in fact, there was a Bush appointee uh, just a few months ago in Kentucky who, um, again, in one of these decisions that held against parents and uh, for the public school, in which he held that the Kentucky students are compelled to watch a pro-gay video that the school had the right to impose a mandatory one-hour video that included dogmatic claims that homosexuality is immutable and that uh, it was wrong for the parents to object and to say that you can't teach my child subjects that are morally offensive to me. I think that is bad law, and uh, yet he did it, and um, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we keep after him, that's all. Because then he's in for life. He didn't look like tenure. Hi, I'm Luan Dumont from New Berlin, and I just want to ask you, I have read your article about this anchor baby and the, the amendment about having these people come in here and have babies and automatically being citizens and the myth of it, and what can we do to correct that? Yes, the question is about anchor babies. Um, there is a tremendous criminal racket going on uh, where th these uh, criminals bring in uh, women who are eight and nine months pregnant to have their baby in this country. And then the baby's immediately declared an American citizen, and that's what we call the anchor baby, because the anchor baby can bring in all his relatives. And uh, they immediately get uh, access to all the kinds of social benefits and health care that American citizens get. And uh, we think there are about 350,000 of these um, anchor babies born in this country every year. Uh, I believe that Congress can, could change this by uh, a law. You will have people tell you it would require a constitutional amendment. I, I don't agree with that, but there certainly would be lit litigation about it. But Congress ought to try to do that. The 14th Amendment says that all persons born are naturalized uh, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens. Now, these Ill illegal aliens do not meet the test of being subject to the jurisdiction thereof. It's just like if you're the French ambassador to the United States and your wife has a baby over here, that baby is, is not an American. That baby is a French citizen. And uh, the real proof that uh, everybody who's born in this territory is not a citizen is the fact that the American Indians were not citizens until, I don't know, 100 years after our country was founded. Uh, they were made citizens by act of Congress. Uh, but just because you're born on this territory uh, does not, sh does not uh, and should not make you a citizen. You should be subject to the jurisdiction thereof. And I believe Congress should deal with this, and uh, there would be a lawsuit about it, I'm sure. But uh, that would be a start in the right direction. Karen Albers, Bob Mendoza, Milwaukee County. Have you any suggestions for how we can get better circuit court judges at the county level? The problem seems to be in Milwaukee County, most of the judges are quite liberal and it's causing some problems. And nobody wants to run against them because the lawyers who would be qualified to be judged are also actively uh, representing clients in front of those judges. And it could cause troubles, you know, if they'd be running against the judge one month and then coming up with a trial before that judge a couple months later. Well, you stated the question very well. Now, in Wisconsin, do you elect your judges, or, or do they have the plan where they're appointed and then run for, for retention? You elect them straight out? Well, you, you got a better opportunity than most states, because the majority of states have this other plan that um, 
uh, that they're appointed, and then, um, then they run for retention, and they're almost always retained. Um, uh, well, you need to mount a campaign, and you stated the problem very well of how they get their campaign uh, contributions from the lawyers who practice before them, and they don't want to cross them, and that is a terrible problem. But I will tell you that the hottest judicial race in the country uh, was in the, uh, the uh, district uh, that I lived in for 44 years with my husband till he, before he passed away, which is uh, the southern part of Illinois. And um, that district had become ground central for these huge uh, judgments. And uh, the, these uh, trial lawyers were coming from all over the country to file their suits in Madison and St. Clair counties. And the woman who lived across the street from my house uh, was an obstetrician. And when her malpractice insurance went to $300,000 a year, she quit, moved to Tennessee. But anyway, they had a big, the big uh, contest because uh, it was a straight out election. And uh, two, two and a half million dollars were spent by both sides in that election. And it was a tremendous victory when we elected the right one. And it was a straight out political battle and people knew what the issues were. So you can win, you can win some of those. And, and uh, you, you have to expose what the judge is doing and uh, you have to raise the money. It's just like a political campaign. Uh, but that was a key case, and, and we did win it. Now, in Missouri, we have the other plan where they had a judge running for uh, retention who um, was pro-abortion, anti-marriage, pro-porn, uh, anti-death penalty, and anti-tort reform. Uh, I don't know. I was the only one in the state of Missouri who was willing to put my name on an ad against him. We, di we didn't win. He got, he, he got more, uh, enough to retain. He's in for 12 years now. But um, that's a real problem. But people need to take this on. It's just a political campaign like anything else. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll take up the judicial issue and talk about it in your little groups and, and make yourself uh, familiar with these subjects so you can call in on the talk shows and read the Riot Act to your uh, representatives. Um, I'd like to make a comment before I ask my question. And I hope that many of us will attend um, Congressman Sensenbrenner's yes. uh, town hall meetings because he needs yes. support. Yes. And uh, he will be having them in various areas very soon during the month of May. Oh, that's, that's very important. Sensenbrenner is fighting a wonderful campaign. And I, I have sent him that, a notice that Eagle Farm is fully backing, backing him. Uh, his bill was passed with the support of 88% of the Republicans in the House. Uh, it isn't perfect, but it's, it's a fine bill, and that's what the Senate ought to pass. And uh, he, does, he does deserve your support, and he deserves your personal support. I do urge you to go to the, if he has town hall meetings, because you can be sure the uh, other side will be there trying to do nasty things to him. Yes, yes. The last time he had one, I was the only one that gave him any support. Everybody else had a different issue. They wanted money for Katrina and money for everything else. But my question, and this bothers me a great deal, is I want to know why the CDC and the NIH uh, totally uh, puts under the radar screen the problem of immigration and the health situation. I don't hear people talking about what's happening with all the diseases and everything that are coming into our country. And I really feel that that should be more on the forefront of that. Well, of course it should. And if you've been subscribing to the Phyllis Schlafly Report, that may be your only source of that information. You know, if you come in legally as an immigrant, you have to pass a health test. You don't think anybody's giving a health exam to these people sneaking over the southern border. Uh, uh, tuberculosis, which we thought we had pretty well cured, is just uh, increasing tremendously. Malaria, which we thought we had cured a long time ago, is coming in and great. They've even bringing in leprosy. They're bringing in uh, uh, intestinal parasites, uh, all kinds of diseases that, that we don't even have in this country. And, and they're simply overburdening our health system. And I don't know any good source except the Phyllis Schlafly report. It's only $20 a year. If, <laughs> if, if you haven't got $20, 
if you haven't got $20, you can go on our wonderful website, eagleforum.org. Did you sign up for Dr. Tony Moresca from Brookfield? I bring you greetings from Dr. Folder and the Heritage Foundation. I just got back last night. The topic of conversation in Washington and Heritage was uh, the big concern with Republicans who go to Congress and even in the state legislatures, but actually don't carry on our conservative values and are, as you said, rhinos in name only. Congressman Boehner was there, and it, I, I'll be honest with you, he did not get it. Congressman Shattuck from Arizona, he actually does get it. Perhaps he should have been our, our next majority leader. But the question I have for you is the uh, the concern of, of, of conservatives in general is, is how do we hold the Republicans who we believe are conservative in nature go on to Washington or our legislatures and actually don't carry on our values? Do we do we how do we continue to support them or do we do we vote against them or what should what should be our next step? Well, that is a tremendous problem. You're, you're absolutely right. And, um, and one thing is they, they go there and they, they get caught up in it and they, they get to thinking they know more and don't have to pay attention to us. Um, I think one of the problems is that um, George Bush has, um, is obviously a big government Republican. And um, they... Uh, they just have the attitude, uh, well, there's a lot of money there, and we know how to spend it better than the Democrats. But it's, it's the large amount of money that um, is, is corrupting of itself. Uh, the other thing is the importance of the uh, big corporate donors. And I mean, that is the reason for the fight about the illegal aliens. Uh, big corporate donors want the cheap labor. There's no question about that. And they have a tremendous impact. And, um, um, it, and holding their feet to the fire, I, uh, I don't know. The other problem is the real lack of leadership in the Senate. I, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're probably 30 or 40 really good guys in the House, and there's some, a few good guys in the Senate, but there isn't any real leadership to say, come on, let's get together and do whatever we ought to be doing. And uh, so what do we do? Um, well, uh, I think in regard to the election coming up this year, uh, the issue of border security should be front and center because it, you can focus in on something that's really important and needed and make that the litmus test. Hello, I'm Mildred Dalton member of the greatest generation and very proud to serve in the World War II. My husband was a prisoner of war, so I'm a woman. My, uh, I will preface this by saying it really irritates me when I hear so many people that should know better refer to our great republic as a democracy. Yes. We are not a democracy. We are a republic. <laughs> When I asked what have you given us, he said a republic if you can keep it. And we are losing it. I've seen so many uh, things going wrong with our Constitution. A thing that bothers me so much, and I would say many of us here, all of us, is when we go to make a purchase and maybe charge it on a charge card, we have to sign a slip to say if we want this in Spanish or American or in English. And that, that, that disturbs me. Now, our great state of Wisconsin was settled primarily by German, uh, Polish, Irish, legal immigrants coming from Europe. And why then can't we choose German, Polish, or one of the other languages? It's discrimination against the rest of us. And everybody's using it when you make a phone call to any branches of government. You should push one for the English, one for another one for Spanish, we are losing our independence little by little. What can we do to fight this and get them to realize that this is an insult to us? These immigrants coming from Mexico and wherever else should learn the language if they want to live here or drive a car. They you're should you're be able to speak right. English language. You're absolutely right. They should have to speak English in order to get a driver's license. Uh, I think English should be officially stated our, as our official language. 
Um, uh, 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 Clinton put through an executive order that said that they had to offer uh, government services in uh, all these other languages. I tried hard to get Bush to rescind it. He wouldn't do it. And uh, I agree with you completely. You stated the problem very well. Uh, the countries that have um, uh, two or more languages have all kinds of problems. Uh, the, uh, Canada, uh, a few years ago, just almost faced the secession of one of its provinces over the language issue. And, uh, they, and I suppose you heard that these protesting people have now done a rewrite of the Star Spangled Banner. And it's, it's, it's not only, it's not the same words in Spanish. They've changed the words, too, to spread their propaganda. And uh, I think we should speak up for uh, the use of the English language. And I think the bilingual education program in school is a kind of a ar language apartheid. It just keeps them yes. keeping Spanish for year, year after year instead of learning English. Uh, we should not be printing foreign language ballots. Um, yes. This is an issue that uh, the Voting Rights Act is coming up for reauthorization next year. Uh, we print uh, foreign language ballots not in German and Polish and Swedish. No, 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 it's very discriminatory. It's, it's only in the Spanish languages and the Asian languages and the American Indian languages. But there, there are just thousands of them are printed and that is an offense to our whole Republican form of government. Yeah, I'll take your question. I wonder if you consider that there's the danger of a threat to the free speech from the pulpit. Uh, yes, there is a danger of a threat to free speech from the pulpit. We have already seen that in Canada uh, and some other countries. And there are groups that are working on that. I, 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 I'm supportive Dr. of Kennedy. Dr. Kennedy. Well, we like Dr. Kennedy. Whatever he's doing is fine. And uh, yeah, he, he's a good friend. And I think they're, they're spearheading that. That doesn't happen to be something that I can give you more information on, but uh, the information is out there. You are right. It's an important question. Over here. I had an unusual experience at our state convention uh, last year. Uh, one of our uh, United States congressmen came up to me and he said, uh, I just want you to know that you were right and I was wrong. <laughs> and I couldn't think what he was talking about. And then I thought, the Equal Rights Amendment. <laughs> he had been, he was raised by a single mother. And he thought that was going to benefit her some way. And, and, but how often do you have a congressman come and see? Well, <laughs> congratulations. And you deserve to have that tribute. You deserve. Yes, uh, that, that is right, and, uh, but I, I will tell you, I get a letter about once a week from some woman who said, I, I used to be a feminist picketing you or kind of demonstrating against you, and now I realize you were right, and thank you for, yeah, I, I do get those letters. And uh, I've also had some important ones on the matter of uh, this dumb idea that some people had to call a new constitutional convention, which could rewrite our Constitution. It's a dumb idea, and I've had people realize I was right, that we don't want that. And now you know there's another bad idea that's coming down the pike of, of the people who have a devious way to get around the Electoral College. So be alert to that. You will be hearing from me on that in another month. But the Electoral College is um, the mirror image of the great compromise that made us a nation. When they created a Congress with one house based on the states and one house based on population. And uh, you, you'll get all the arguments uh, in another month or so, but th it's another bad idea that, that's coming out from these people who really don't like our Constitution. You, you just have to understand, there are a lot of powerful people in this country who don't like our Constitution. And I'm one who believes that the solution to most of our problems is right there in the way it was written. It's, it's uh, several people, including Madison, Washington, and others, called it a miracle that it happened. 
And it is a marvelous document. And it isn't evolving. It's there in black and white. And we can't let people evolve it. Another question here. There's such a time, and there are a number of people who have other obligations. So we could do this question and answer all day. Gina, Steve, Mike, Blanca, Um Recently, there's been some talk about getting our tax system reformed, and I've heard somewhat about fair tax. Could you talk a little bit about what you know about that, and if you think that could ever happen, or do you think they're just not going to want the power to get out of their hands? Uh, well, I think it's good that they're talking about reforming because there are a lot of things that are unfair about the tax system at the present time. I, I'm not an expert on that. I think the fair tax is basically to move to a sales tax instead of an income tax. And I'm just afraid they might give us both if we... <laughs> but so uh, I, I think we should study it. There are a lot of uh, things that are unfair about the tax system. And uh, again, these are all issues that, that you need to be concerned about. And uh, I, I hope the result of this is that you, you, each one of you will have a, a mission to take on some part of this fight. Uh, we have the president of your Wisconsin Federation of Republican Women here today. Uh, direct party politics is important. I used to be the president of the Illinois Federation of Republican Women. And uh, to the pro-lifers, uh, group, groups are here. I want to tell you my particular mission in that area has been to save the pro-life plank and the Republican platform. This has been a knockdown, drag out <coughs> fight at many Republican conventions, and we had to raise money and organize our troops to protect that, uh, which is a beautiful, a beautiful pro-life statement and important to have it, and then to hold our Republican elected officials uh, accountable to the platform. So these are all areas that you can work on, and there's we we need we need every one of you to take on some part, and I do hope there will be some who will start study groups on the courts uh, with my uh, new uh, book because we need people like you to be able to uh, talk about it uh, to uh, your congressman and get them to take the action that needs to be taken. <laughs> uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you for inviting me.